All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, um, to this briefing. I'm Lisa Lowe Vaudren, and I'm going to speak to you about the 30th AU Summit that just came to an end uh, on Monday. I just arrived yesterday where I was attending with my colleagues from uh, the ISS office in Addis Ababa. Generally, a very interesting summit, uh, very dynamic, and um, many people, new faces attending, um, but also frustrating. I'll be touching on some of the issues that really weren't resolved, like, for example, the reforms, um, that there is still not clarity about the way forward on many of them. So I will be looking at uh, just a few aspects, and then please feel free to ask questions. The, first of all, the new Peace and Security Council that was elected, uh, 10 new members, and then um, the reforms, crucial reforms going forward. A couple of continental initiatives uh, that were launched, and I think that is definitely indicative of this new dynamic, especially with President Paul Kagame steering the AU like uh, a business organization, almost a CEO, which is not to the... Um, doesn't please everybody in an organization that is really characterized by consensus and uh, and having everybody on board, especially the heavyweight countries. There were a few peace and security issues, as usual. Um, the crisis in South Sudan, notably Libya, uh, the Central African Republic was mentioned, and... Um, in all the speeches there was mention made of the um, serious migration problems, slavery uh, allegations in Libya, etc. But contrary to previous summits, this really didn't dominate uh, the AU. We've seen previously, for example, we had Salva Kiir and Rick Machar meeting one another with initiatives um, on South Sudan. But the reforms really was the most important issue that took most of the heads of state's time. And then the theme on corruption, which I'll just briefly touch on, um, caught a lot of media attention. And it's very interesting that this theme for the year, as previous themes on the youth, on gender, etc., um, was really uh, an initiative from some of civil society. And it shows that, um, in a sense, the AU that's very closed and that's always been very top down and just a meeting of presidents uh, in a way might start to be open to some in input and pressure from civil society that something we've really never seen before. So just to start briefly with the um, Peace and Security Council, 10 new members uh, in North Africa, we expected a bit of a fight between Morocco and Algeria. They were both candidates right up to the last minute, um, and Algeria withdrew um, because it said that uh, it would rather stand in January 2019 for a three-year seat. Um, but it also seems evident that Morocco really would have justified to get that position because Morocco is the new member. It's never served on the Peace and Security Council. So um, in that sense, it was almost a done deal. Now, that will change a lot of the dynamics within uh, the AU. We now have North Africa with two heavyweight countries. We have South Africa stepping down from the AU. In Southern Africa, we've got new members, Angola and Zimbabwe. Uh, and Zambia is then the three-year member. Um, and it will be also interesting to see to what extent Angola, as the uh, fifth, sixth uh, economy on the continent, is going to um, step up its diplomacy, which Angola really hasn't uh, up to now been very involved. The president, former president Dos Santos hardly ever attended the summits. But the new president, Joao uh, Lorenzo, was there, made statements. So it will be interesting to see, especially on the dossier of the DRC, whether um, the Angola will now weigh in on those decisions. The only um, other heavyweight we really have is Nigeria and West Africa. And interestingly, uh, Nigeria has been a member of the Peace and Security Council since 2004. Uh, it's almost an unwritten rule that you have Nigeria as the almost permanent member. Three small countries, Togo, um, Liberia and Sierra Leone, were now elected for two years. 
And then uh, in East Africa, we also saw a bit of a surprise, Ethiopia withdrawing its candidature at the, at the last minute. Djibouti and Rwanda are the new members then of, Can uh, 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 of East Africa. So it's a really a new dynamic. Perhaps just on South Africa, we were told that because South Africa is now candidate for a UN uh, Security Council non-permanent seat, that's one of the reasons South Africa is now um, stepping back for two years. But it will definitely um, make a difference to the Peace and Security Council, which is the highest de decision-making body of the AU um, between summits, and it, and it makes a lot of decisions on... Um, definitely uh, security issues and, and decision making. Um, so as I said, North Africa is there, Algeria is not there. So one of the major crises on the continent that is very important for the AU, the Sahel crisis, you, you don't have any uh, concern member, neither Chad, Niger, uh, um, Burkina Faso, but of course the uh, terrorism in, uh, concerning Boko Haram, Nigeria is there. Egypt um, was chairing the Peace and Security Summit that we had just before the start of the um, Assembly of Heads of State, and they basically put terrorism again on the agenda. And we can uh, ask the question, um, the AU has had several summit meetings, extraordinary summits to deal with uh, terrorism, but has it really been able to make an impact? Um, and then, of course, Morocco on the dossier of the Western Sahara. Morocco's strategy in the AU is basically uh, to have all discussions around this crisis move to the United uh, Nations Security Council, where it has strong support from uh, permanent members like uh, France and the US. So that dynamic uh, in the PSC is really changing. We can say uh, where a couple of years ago, uh, even at the ISS, we were speculating whether the PEC is going to move to some kind of uh, um, security council of heavyweights because you had South Africa, you had Ethiopia, you had Algeria there, uh, Egypt. Uh, one could have seen Nigeria, a kind of coalition of the big powers. But generally, um, also when it comes to the reform, we almost see smaller countries leading changes in the African Union, while the heavyweights are almost the ones saying, uh, keep keeping the reforms back. Um, on NEPAD that I would uh, speak on briefly as well, we saw uh, countries like Algeria, South Africa, SADC generally objecting to any reform of these institutions. So we have an interesting new dynamic. Rwanda definitely leading it uh, together with smaller countries like Chad um, and, and a few others, whereas the big powers are reluctant uh, to participate in this. Just to come back briefly to the PSC, um, so discussions are likely to change in the PSC when it comes to conflict. Um, we've seen now in 2017 on the agenda of the PSC, as you can see on the slide, um, a bit of a shift. South Sudan is still very much on the agenda, where in 2015 and 2016 we had Burundi occupying a huge amount of time of the AU last year. 4% of the discussions were on Burundi because, as you know, the initiative from the ambassadors in Addis Ababa to send an intervention force to Burundi was shut down by heads of state. And that has made a huge difference in the PSC in a sense that um, now only 30% of the PSC's discussions in 2017 were on crisis situations, so Somalia, DRC, etc. Um, and the rest were more generals, not softer issues, but what we, there wasn't real decisions to be made. Are we going to sanction the belligerents in South Sudan? Are we going to insist on um, presidents to not renew their mandates, President Joseph Kabila? So it weakens, in a sense, the PSC's uh, decision making. But we might see a new dynamic now uh, in um, 20, 2018. So uh, just to look at the reforms, as I said, it was really at the heart of all these discussions and decision makings. Very frustrating for many people because um, there was a lot of um, lobbying uh, on the sidelines by the Troika that is now leading 
uh, up to now ha has now led the reforms. That's President Idris Debi of, of Chad um, and uh, Paul Kagame leading this from uh, Rwanda and then Alpha Conde from Guinea. And um, it's really interesting in the sense that we felt there was almost a parallel dynamic. On the one hand, Ru uh, uh, Paul Kagame and his team have already made a lot of changes. They, for example, already nominated an implementation committee in the office of the chairperson, um, um, uh, Muhammad, Musafaki Muhammad. Uh, they've already started working on NEPAD. Uh, there's no decision yet on reforming the NEPAD into the AU Development Agency, but I spoke to people who um, at least one AU star, top star, uh, staff member who is now moving to Johannesburg and is going to run the AU Development Agency. So we almost have uh, things moving relatively well, um, but on the other hand, a lot of concerns about uh, mostly the methodology followed. So maybe just quickly um, a few points. The Troika is a controversial decision. It's not part of the AU Constitutive Act. The AU Constitutive Act says you have a chairperson and, and, and uh, then a bureau representative of all the regions. So you have five members uh, every year elected. Um, but the Kagame team felt that this troika would drive things um, faster. So what happened at the summit was some kind of compromise was reached. Um, in the draft decisions of the assembly, we see the Troika working with the Bureau. Other members of the Kagame team told us, well, actually going forward, the Troika will be inside the Bureau. So there's some kind of compromise, but a victory actually for the reform team is that now in January, one year before next year's summit, Already we know who's going to be 2019's um, heading the AU is um, President al-Sisi of, uh, of Egypt. Just the last word on the Troika. Interestingly, um, we have a number of heads of state who were appointed as chairing the AU while they were facing presidential elections in that year. Uh, we had President Idris Deby in 2016. He was nominated AU chair and there were presidential elections in that year. We had um, Paul Kagame who was nominated and he was facing presidential elections in August. And now we have al Sisi who's also up for elections in March. But um, if you look at the AU Constitutive Act, it is a country that's elected to lead uh, the AU for that year. So it can be justified, but it... But the head of state is announced at the summit saying President al-Sisi of Egypt is going to chair the AU in uh, 2019, almost as if it doesn't matter whether you're facing a presidential election. And then at the same time also, if we look at those ones running the country, I mean, President Paul Kagame won the elections with over 90%. Uh, al-Sisi, we know that the, um, most of the, his uh, opponents in the election have withdrawn. Uh, Idris Deby also issues around democracy. So um, my colleague in Addis is actually doing an analysis of the new members of the PSC and how on the Mo Ibrahim Index of Democratization, uh, how they fare. Because, of course, this is for SADC also an issue, is that um, where are we going if the, uh, if the AU is being led by uh, heads of state that are not uh, necessarily considered Democrats? So just to uh, quickly go through other reforms that we've seen uh, from 2019, there'll only be one summit uh, a year instead of two. And in July in 2019, there will be then only a summit of the, um, the Bureau and then one representative of each regional economic community who will then be leading. So if it was this year, um, it would have been South Africa then representing SADC. Um, so that, that's one of the achievements uh, of the reforms. Uh, NEPAD um, is interesting. I mean, we've almost forgotten about NEPAD and whether it still plays a role. Um, it's been sort of chugging along here in South Africa. But when you speak to representatives of SADC, they, they um, are very concerned. And NEPAD has almost become symbolic of uh, this whole process where 
the smaller countries are moving forward fast with something and, and others are reluctant. I was listening to the um, Algerian Prime Minister, for example, speaking about NEPAD, saying, remember that NEPAD was created in 2001 before the AU, so it's not something that is a latecomer that we um, sort of tagged onto the AU. It's on the core of the African Union. Um, it must still drive that agenda of uh, infrastructure reform on the continent, etc. But there's also a sense by, um, as you can remember, it was South Africa, Algeria, um, Nigeria that drove that reform in 2001, 2002. So there's a sense by the heavyweight countries that um, we are now being left behind and that our initiatives are not being pursued the African peer review mechanism seems to be getting a new dynamic, although um, President Idris Deby of Chad has now been appointed the new chair to take over from Uhuru Kenyatta. So we'll, we'll see how that pans out. Oh, the self-financing I forgot to mention. Also, uh, that is definitely something that's going ahead. Uh, um, there's a lot of opposition. Um, it was announced at the summit that 21 countries on board have already started implementing this. Uh, a little compromise to the ones who object uh, is the fact that from 10 member states, uh, the F10 foreign ministers driving this, it's now been expanded to 15 with three representatives from each region. So you can see there's, there are little compromises, but at the end of the day, uh, these things are moving ahead. Now, the the 0.2 percent is controversial. Uh, we see the countries that are on board are, for example, Kenya, Rwanda, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, Chad, Gabon, none of the biggest countries. Another compromise that was made in terms of self-financing, and that was Donald Kabaruka's suggestion already last year, um, was <laughs> that if countries, any surplus that will be gathered um, by the 0.2% um, will go, initially it was said it will go to in a reserve fund. So a country like South Africa, if you're going to impose 0.2% of all imp eligible imports and channel that to the A, it's a massive amount. Um, it would be, it would go beyond South Africa's assessed contribution. Um, so the, it was now said that any reserve funds will go back to the country. So we can keep everything that is over the 0.2%, uh, <coughs> which is a kind of a compromise. I have one slide here from our, uh, just to show you the con assessed contributions. I was doing something on Morocco's um, input in the AU. So you can see, um, according to the planning by the AU, you will still, countries will still be kept to their 9.6%. So those four heavyweight big countries, um, South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Algeria, now Morocco as well, um, will carry, uh, will through the 0.2%, contribute the 9.6%. But I can suspect even South Africa can then, um, as in the past, just uh, channel the funds to the AU if it's not on board on the 0.2%. Angola was supposed to replace Libya in 2015, uh, according to what was decided at the summit here in Johannesburg. But now its economy is smaller than Morocco. So these um, are about 56% of, um, of the AU funds will still come from heavyweights kind of complicated and um, it's not exactly clear to everyone how this is going to pan out. Um, so just to go back to the reforms, I think that was more or less it. A lot of outstanding issues still in terms of um, the role of the RECs uh, coordinating um, between the AU. Um, of course, the reforms, the idea of the reforms and what a lot of people are objecting uh, to is it will make a stronger African Union Commission in Addis Ababa that can weigh in on decisions. Uh, we were told a country like Egypt simply is against the reforms because they don't want a strong AU um, to impose on them. They'd rather play in the Arab League, etc. But these are these are what people are saying in the corridors and not necessarily 
um, always, I mean, there's sometimes a disconnect on what the delegates would tell you or the ambassador and then the, what the head of state decides. So it's very difficult. But in any event, um, those are there, are, there are a lot of issues that, that still have to be decided. Uh, the NEPAD reform, for example, on the final decision or the draft decisions of, the, of this assembly, they have now decided a final decision will be held in uh, June, July in, um, in uh, Nwakshot, Mauritania, where the next uh, meeting is supposed to be taking place. Um, so in terms of the reform, I mean, you can uh, ask any questions. I can go into more detail of what was decided. Um, so here I've just put a slide of Africa's heavyweights. It was a bit last minute because <laughs> we were working <laughs> until yesterday. But I must just, uh, as I said, some continental issues. It really makes one very optimistic about uh, where the continent is going. Three major decisions were taken and implemented. The first one was, is on the single air transport market. It was launched at uh, the summit in Addis Ababa. And, uh, of course, President Paul Kagame is leading that as well. Um, but I we spoke to... Um, some of the members who used to be in the UN Economic Commission for Africa and knows these things says that it would be hugely advantageous for a company like Ethiopian Airlines that have got a hundred aeroplanes and all flying all over the continent, and even Rwanda Air and and smaller companies, uh, Kenya Airways, South African Airways, is is not there and uh, has really. Um, not been uh, as active as it could have been. It could have seized this opportunity, but maybe. So it, it basically means for those of us who you know, are not that uh, economically minded, it means that um, African airlines will have huge advantages flying around the continent compared to your outsiders, Air France, uh, British Airways, etc. So because there won't be those um, taxes to be paid. Secondly, on the continental free trade area, Paul Kagame is hosting an extraordinary summit, summit on the 21st of March in Kigali where something will be signed around the continental free trade area. The economists and people who have been dealing with this say that, of course, n not all the very complicated issues uh, in terms of that continental free trade area has now been clarified, but still... Um, the it's it's going to be signed and and it's moving ahead. And the last one is the protocol on free movement of people. Um, so uh, that the protocol has been signed. So it's about um, free movement of persons, uh, rights of residence, and rights of establishment. And um, the, uh, so the protocol was signed, but we expect it won't come into force before 15 countries uh, have signed that. Also very controversial, of course. Smaller countries want free movement of people. Uh, bigger countries want free movement of goods and continental free trade areas. So we, we always have to juggle these sensibilities. Um, I think I've... I don't know where my time is, but um, I just want to very quickly, if you if you then have questions about the issues, really there are no um, strong decisions that were taken, either on Libya asking again UN-AU cooperation, the AU is still being sidelined in many of the decisions on Libya, South Sudan, there was strong um, statements you might have heard in the media from Guterres from the UN, uh, Musafaki Mohammed calling for sanctions against the belligerents. But we know that IGAD, the neighboring states, are the ones that are making the decisions on uh, South Sudan. And uh, it is for them really to uh, have a united position on, on sanctions against the belligerents. So no real movement uh, on issues like Somalia. Um, the Central African Republic, you can see in the statements, 
Um, those are some of the issues. It seems as if uh, 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 the chairperson of the Commission for Peace and Security was very strong on the fact that Ami Som, after the 14 October attack of last year, really needs to stay. We need the assessed contributions from the UN, and we know there is less and less UN funding. Um, so from the AU side, they want Ami Som not to draw down um, as planned. Uh, the plan is in 2018 that uh, there are 1,000 fewer troops and that there are 500 police uh, that will be deployed, and then this drawdown will continue. Um, but it, it, so it's a perpetual uh, uh, issue between the AU and the UN, give us more funding. Um, so there was the DRC, um, but I can speak to other issues. For example, there's this initiative to silence the guns by 2020. The former um, Foreign Minister of Algeria and former Peace and Security Commissioner Ramtan Lamamra has been now appointed by the AU to do this. I mean, that's really a poison chalice to uh, silence the guns by 2020, but he's taken up that position. Um, so very briefly, finally, the fight against corruption got a lot of media attention. President Muhammadu Buhari of uh, Nigeria is the one championing this. Um, he is seen as a figure that brought some dynamic in Nigeria. It's all very difficult to do. He's going to launch a number of initiatives, like a big youth summit on corruption. Um, he also spoke about getting more and more countries to sign up to the AU Convention on uh, corruption, Combating Corruption um, and um, also to strengthen the AU's institutions like the AU um, advisory board on corruption uh, to bring that dynamic. But really, um, the the corruption issues, I mean, it, it was sort of a uh, an attractive issue to discuss and for the media. But there's not much the AU can do if individual countries are not on board and individual leaders, of course. Um, so there's our heads of state attending with Mahmoud Abbas, as usual. George Weyer, that you see in brilliant white there in the back is was the star of the AU summit of 2017 um, and he was applauded so and we had many newcomers uh, Emerson Manangagwa of course made a speech uh, we had the president new president of Angola um, so all in all uh, I think a very good summit very interesting new dynamics uh, a lot of resistance from especially SADC, Southern Africa and the heavyweight countries. But the AU seems to be moving uh, in a whole, in a positive direction.